On our newscast tonight, it's no secret that the Korean economy is heavily dependent on its conglomerates, but a new report showing that the combined operating profits of Samsung and Hyundai Motor accounts for more than 30 percent of all Korean companies is raising concerns of financial instability in the event of an economic crisis. Reunifications of the two Koreas, it's considered an elusive dream, but nonetheless one that's being discussed more and more these days. We discuss why and how reunification could benefit both Koreas. Archbishop Andrew Yom Soo Jung is created a cardinal by Pope Francis at St. Peter's Square. We take a closer look at the man who's become Korea's third ever cardinal. Stay with us for these stories and more. It is 4 a.m. in Washington, 10 at Vatican City, and 6 on a Monday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Moon Gon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. Defense cost sharing, that's our starting point today. Right after a months long tug of war, South Korea and the U.S. have finally settled on a new cost sharing agreement for the stationing of U.S. troops here in Korea. But some are wondering aloud whether this was the best Seoul could do. Our Han Daun starts us off. 866.6 million U.S. dollars. That is the amount South Korea will pay this year to keep the more than 28,000 U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula. Seoul's foreign ministry says this was a successful deal as Washington has settled on an amount that's 75 million dollars less than what it initially wanted, despite automatic spending cuts known as the sequester that have slashed the military's budget. But what's more worthy of notice, officials say, is that the U.S. agreed on specific measures to enhance transparency. Washington had long been criticized by the South Korean public for not revealing how defense costs were spent. A new monitoring system will be set up that will effectively track shared military expenditures, and the two sides will be required to submit annual spending reports to the Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue, better known as KIDD. The U.S. will also report defense cost outlays on the peninsula to the Korean parliament. We have made an effort to produce a reasonable outcome that's acceptable to the parliament and the people, taking into account the stationing conditions for the U.S. troops, as well as our government's financial capacity. But some are critical of the deal, saying it has left several long-standing issues unresolved. They point out that Washington is not keeping its promise to shoulder the cost of relocating the main U.S. military base from Seoul to Pyeongtaek in 2016. Instead, they seem to be amassing a large amount of money and asking for more, but it's not clear how much has gone to the Pyeongtaek relocation. The deal will be taken to the parliament in early February for ratification. But amid such divided opinions, it looks like it won't necessarily be smooth sailing. And then, I did news. Amid the backdrop of tension and uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula, South Korea's military has been placing extra emphasis on being combat ready to face any threat from North Korea. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports on winter training exercises currently underway on the outskirts of Korea's Olympic town of Pyeongchang. It goes without saying that maintaining a staunch defense against possible North Korean provocations is one of the Park Geun-hye administration's key goals this year and the remaining years of her term thereafter. And the president has made it clear that strengthening national security is very high on her agenda. To ensure readiness, the Defense Ministry initiated a winter exercise last week in Pyeongchang-kun, Gangwon-do province, a place well known for its brutally cold winters, where temperatures regularly plunge below minus 20 degrees Celsius. Scores of Special Forces cadets are busy training, despite the bone-chillingly cold temperatures. It's a clear display of South Korea's military might and readiness to fight off any attack from the north. But it's just another day for South Korea's special forces. Whether it's blistering hot or numbingly cold, 
These men are ready to fight and successfully carry out their missions. To successfully conduct our missions in extreme conditions, we are enhancing our combat capabilities through realistic training. They showed off numerous maneuvers, with cadets skiing down slopes, sniping down potential enemies, while reaching their targets undetected. These types of training exercises are held throughout the nation periodically. They serve two purposes, ensuring complete military readiness to potential threats, and giving the public the peace of mind that the military can keep them safe from an unpredictable northern neighbor. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Pyeongchang. On the first of the annual New Year's press conferences by leaders of the nation's main political parties, the chief of the main opposition Democratic Party took aim at President Park Geun-hye on Monday. In his remarks, he also stressed universal welfare and a gradual reunification with North Korea. The ruling Senator Party is scheduled to hold its presser on Thursday, rather Tuesday, that is. And our Kim Hyun-ji has this report. Democratic Party chief Kim An Gil criticized President Park's New Year's speech, saying she failed to provide concrete details on how she intends to improve the livelihoods of ordinary people in a country with the world's highest suicide rate among the young and senior citizens. The president did not mention economic democratization or welfare even once during her New Year's speech. It's shocking. Kim said his party will promote welfare support aimed at helping people live a dignified life. My party will strengthen policy for education, housing and health care to stop the collapse of the middle class and restore the ladder of hope that enables the poor to move into the upper class. Specifically, the Democratic Party chief said his party will push for free school meals, free high school education, and cutting the cost of college tuition in half. He added that he and his party will work toward putting a cap on rental prices, including jeonse, which requires that a large lump sum deposit be paid up front and is returned in full at the end of the rental period. Kim also called for a strengthening of public health care policy and an expansion of public medical facilities for patients with severe diseases and dementia. He stressed that the party will oppose any attempt by the government to privatize health care or railway services. He also said he welcomed President Park's concept of reunification as a jackpot for the two Koreas but stressed that the government must be sure to take practical steps to improve inter-Korean relations and prepare for a gradual and peaceful reunification with North Korea. Targeting the local elections in June, the Democratic Party leader vowed to overcome the factionalism within his party and respond quickly to the public's demands. To break a long-standing deadlock in parliament, he pledged to push for an independent investigation into the alleged illegal electioneering by state institutions in 2012. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. In her New Year's speech, President Park Geun-hye talked about the possibility of a reunified Korea. For the first in our three-part series on reunification, we want to take a closer look at why reunification would be beneficial for the two Koreas. And for that, we're joined live by our Unification Ministry correspondent, Hwang sung hee from Arirang News Center. Hello there, sung hee Good evening, guys. Simply put, President Park Geun-hye said that for both Koreas, reunification would be like hitting the jackpot. And before we get into why a reunified Korea could be beneficial to both sides and how, I went out to find out what the general public thinks. I oppose reunification 100 percent. I predict that reunification will have a very negative effect on the South. If reunification were to take place at a time when both the South Korean economy and the North Korean economy were not doing well, I think both Koreas could collapse. Because of the considerable differences between the South and the North, I think it would be better to boost economic cooperation between them, then move toward reunification. So for now, I'm against the idea of reunification. As you can see, not many people out there were enthusiastic about reunification. 
A recent poll conducted by the Joseon Ilbo shows only two in ten South Koreans are saying yes to a reunified Korea. The majority seems to think reunification will just add to Seoul's economic burden. Right. Clearly, we fear what we do not know. We have not yet experienced. The big question is, will it add to Seoul's economic burden, as many fear? Well, Daniel, there are varying estimates on how much it would cost to reunify the two Koreas, ranging from 800 billion U.S. dollars to as much as four and a half trillion dollars. The Korea Institute for National Unification recently said it would cost around three and a half trillion to integrate the two Koreas during the first 20 years after reunification, but that 80 percent of the cost would come from the private sector and foreign investors. Now that means the actual cost to the government and to the general public would only be around 800 billion dollars. And it seems like the economic benefits of reunification could be much larger larger than the initial cost. So, uh, Sunny, uh, there are we talking about the jackpot that President Park Geun-hye mentioned in her New Year's uh, press conference? That's right, Kanyang. If you take a look at the figures, reunification would definitely be like hitting the jackpot, and that will be evident in the speed of a reunified Korea's economic growth. If we suppose that the two Koreas were to reunite this year, the pace of economic growth would more than double to hover at around 4.5% annually, at least throughout the next four decades. In fact, we would eventually see Korea rise as one of the world's seven largest economies. South Korea is currently the world's 10th largest economy, but by 2050, a reunified Korea could move up to fifth place. Reunification will combine the population of the two Koreas for a total of 70 million, and it would slow the aging of the society, since North Korea has a younger population than the South, and it would increase the number of people in the workforce. Now, with that, the per capita gross national income would increase from the current $23,000 in South Korea to more than $80,000 in a reunified Korea in 2050. And if there were no more security threats on the Korean peninsula, Korea could reduce its military spending and boost spending on more productive things. Well, clearly there is much more to gain in the long run, but I hate to be a wet blanket. We need to leave no stones unturned. So uh, there are some potential problems with reunifications also, right? Of course, Daniel, all of these positive figures would only be possible under a gradual and smooth reunification. But experts have warned of a possible rise in social welfare spending in the event of a reunification. Uh, first of all, if uh, the pros process of unification involves any kind of uh, military conflict, then uh, this conflict will affect uh, both countries a lot in a negative way. The second one is uh, uh, if unification uh, takes pl place in a radical way, as in German, Germany, then uh, this will increase uh, South Korea's expenditure on a social safety net in North Korea. Experts also say that if there is any opposition to privatization in North Korea or policy mistakes in dealing with the integration of the two currencies, the cost of reunification will increase and the benefits will decrease. All right, thank you, Sunny, for that. That was Arirang News' Hwang sung -hee with an analysis of a possible reunification of the two Koreas. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Now, shifting our focus, it appears the Korean economy is becoming even more dependent on its two biggest conglomerates, Samsung and Hyundai Motor. The combined operating profit of the two conglomerates accounted for more than 30 percent of the combined operating profit of all Korean companies for the first time in 2012, according to market research site Chebol.com. 
Samsung accounted for about 21 percent of local companies' combined operating profit, and Hyundai Motor about 9 percent. Now, that is a combined increase of roughly 6 percent compared to the previous year. Experts have raised concerns that the country's heavy reliance on the two conglomerates could more easily trigger financial instability when the country is hit by a crisis. Now, responding to the report, Finance Minister Hyunsook said Monday that there is a need to closely analyze the economic concentration of Samsung and Hyundai. And it's becoming harder for young people to find a stable job, and recent figures tell the tale. Last year, over 20 percent of young people aged 15 to 29 were hired as temporary workers for their first job. This, according to Statistics Korea on Monday. Now, that's double the percentage of young people hired as temporary workers back in 2008. Over the same five period, from 2008 to 2013, the number of young people in the same age group who found stable long-term jobs dropped by half to 128,000. Now, experts say the problem is a lack of high-quality jobs, which is in turn a result of the effects of the global financial crisis. This, of course, is disheartening news for young job seekers who were already struggling with a low employment rate of 40 percent as of last month, a figure that puts Korea 29th out of 34 OECD countries in terms of youth employment. We have a five-parter series in Korea's industrial competitiveness. The first one is on parts and materials. The sector, which used to depend heavily on imports, is now leading the nation's exports thanks to active corporate investment and government support. Our Hwang Jihye looks at the sector's prospect and the challenges that remain. This Korean semiconductor packaging company has recently found a way to make the world's thinnest chip. Normally, companies produce one millimeter thick semiconductors, but we're able to produce them with a thickness of half of that. We are ahead of every other company. Until around 10 years ago, Korean companies hardly reported any breakthrough in the manufacturing of parts and materials, but it's a different story these days. Now Korea is the world's fifth largest parts and materials exporting nation closely following Japan. And with the domestic parts and materials sectors getting a boost recently, the trade surplus last year reached a record high of nearly $100 billion. That is nearly 40 times larger than the sector's trade surplus recorded in 2001. Exports of parts and materials currently take up almost half of the nation's overall exports. Experts say the improving competitive edge of Korea's finished goods are also helping the parts and materials sectors. The rise in exports of products like television, mobile phones, automobiles and machinery have pushed up demand for key components of those goods. The Seoul government is determined to make Korea the world's fourth largest exporter of parts and materials by 2020, surpassing Japan and more than doubling the sector's trade surplus to $250 billion. While the nation has made a leap forward in manufacturing parts, it still lags behind in developing new materials. The problem is Korea is far behind Japan in the area of new materials, while China is catching up fast in making parts. To narrow the gap with Japan, the government has promised to pour $280 million into the local industry every year until 2025. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. We have some good news for Korean consumers looking for bargains on their favorite name brand import products. The finance ministry said Monday that it will lay out measures to increase competition among importers by the end of March as a means to bring down prices. One of them includes allowing so-called parallel imports. The moves are expected to make some imports like cosmetics and clothing 20 to 30 percent cheaper on average in Korea. The price tag on some products could even drop by as much as 50 percent. In the Catholic Church's history, just two Koreans have been created cardinals until now. Archbishop Andrew Yom Su-jung will become the third next month, following Stephen Kim su hwan and Nicholas Chung jin Seok. In his celebratory ceremony on this Monday, Yom explained the type of cardinal he hopes to be. Our Yudian reports. 
dressed in a violet gown, Archbishop Yeom Su Jung seemed stern faced during a ceremony at the Myeongdong Cathedral in central Seoul to celebrate his appointment as cardinal. It seems like most of the people here are happy except for me. The title as new cardinal is a fearful and heavy one. I will work to create a church that serves the poor and those who are isolated from society. Standing in front of about 300 Catholics and journalists who braved the freezing cold to attend the ceremony, Yum laid out his vision as cardinal. Through my small sacrifices, sharing and love, I will work toward creating a church that could heal the conflicts and divisions that are rampant in our society. Archbishop Yum was appointed a cardinal by Pope Francis on Sunday at St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. He is currently the de facto leader of the Korean Catholic Church. Yum was born into and raised by a highly religious family. He graduated from the Catholic University of Korea in 1970, was ordained a priest in the same year, and was appointed as the 14th Catholic Archbishop of Seoul by Pope Benedict XVI in 2012. Yum also serves as chairman of the Catholic television channel Peace Broadcasting Corporation and continues the Pabo Nanum or Full Sharing Foundation established by late Cardinal Stephen Kim Suwan. Religious leaders in Korea welcome the Pope's choice and express hope that Korea's church will contribute to the Asian and global Catholic communities. 18 others will join Yum as newly appointed cardinals. The decision on archbishops from Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso and Haiti, which marked its fourth anniversary since a deadly earthquake, reflect Pope Francis' commitment to the poor. Andrew Yum Sujong will be officially appointed as a cardinal on February 22nd. Yudian, Arirang News. Well, Koreans have been in a particularly giving mood this holiday season. The Community Chest of Korea sharing campaign, which will continue for two and a half more weeks, has already met its target amount of donations for the season. The campaign passed the $293 million mark on Monday. That is the highest total given since 1999. And there's still plenty of time to rack up the total even higher. Donations will be accepted through January 31st. The money goes toward basic welfare recipients such as the disabled, socially disadvantaged elderly people and low-income families. Moving over to Thailand, when Thai Prime Minister Ing Lak Shinawad called for early elections in February, she hoped it would quell months of unrest spurred by those hoping to boot her from office. But the protesters remain undeterred and launched a new strategy on Monday in a bid to shut down the capital city of Bangkok. Our Connie Kim reports. Masses of anti-government protesters in Thailand on Monday began an attempt to shut down the capital city Bangkok and overthrow embattled Prime Minister Ng Lak Shinawat. The protesters say they want an appointed government to run the country and a cancellation of February elections, which Ng Lak's ruling party are almost certain to win. They say the current leader is only a proxy for her brother, exiled former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who was ousted by the military in 2006. Ahead of the planned shutdown, protesters on Sunday, led by head protest leader Sutep Tak Suban, started blocking major intersections in the capital to create traffic jams where an estimated 700,000 vehicles pass through on a daily basis. Things turned violent when unknown gunmen opened fire on a group of anti-government protesters at a rally site in Bangkok. At least seven people were injured. Dozens of schools, hospitals, hotels and fire stations are within the areas that are being affected by the shutdown. Protest leader Su Teb said the rallies will continue unless Prime Minister Ng Lak steps down. We cannot compromise on any offers. This is non-negotiable. So if we lose this fight, then we lose. If we win, then we win. There's no win-win for both sides. The army and the police have expressed concerns of escalating violence that could lead to a coup attempt. The government has beefed up security, stationing some 15-thousand police and military personnel in and around the capital. Since the protests began in October, eight people have died and dozens of others have been injured in street violence. Connie Kim, Arirang News.
time now to get a check on the weather conditions for that. Let's go over to our Kim Bogang at the Weather Center. Bogang, it's been a freezing cold day here in Seoul. Um, how are other regions of this country looking like? Well, Kanya, we're not the only ones dealing with these frigid temperatures because cold wave advisories have been issued throughout the country. And it's not just cold, the air feels very dry as well. That's right. The humidity level in Seoul and the East Coast regions are only at 20 percent, so we've got a mixture of dry and cold weather in the nation. Now, in this weather, make sure to drink a lot of water and to keep yourselves hydrated. Well, it's currently minus 2 degrees here in Seoul, but it feels a lot colder due to the strong cold winds. A cold wave alert has been issued in Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces and a cold wave warning in most parts of the central regions. Looking ahead at tomorrow's readings, Seoul starts off the day at minus 9 degrees with a high of 1. Meanwhile, Daegu and Gwangju peak at 3. Moving on to other regions. Jeju reaches 5 degrees while Dokdo and Mount Kumgang top out at 1 and minus 8 degrees respectively. Well, stay warm in the cold and make sure you don't catch a cold. Back to you guys. Thank you for that, Po Gyeong. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. This has been Daniel Chan. And I'm Moon Gon Young. Thank you, as always, for being here with us. Have a wonderful rest of the evening, and we'll see you right back here, same time, tomorrow. Good night.